I'm Nancy Davenport. I'm the university librarian. I am very pleased to welcome you all to this particular session of Exploring Social Justice. This book, The Color of Law, I will talk about in just a minute. But first, I need to thank a couple of people. I need to thank K Spiritual Life, who has been our partner in putting these programs on and bringing audience to them as well. I need to thank the University Center for Diversity and Inclusion, who has also been a very strong partner with us as we've explored questions of social justice. And for this particular one, I need to thank the law school, because the law school is also our partner in putting on this program on the color of law. Before I introduce Billy Joe, who's going to introduce our speaker, um, I want to give you my personal reaction to this book, which is there have been two books in this series this year that have both touched me in a way that was incredible and broken my heart and made me cry. This was one of those two. The other one was um, stamped from the beginning, which was Professor Kindy's book. And he's one of our faculty members here at the university. And his book, which he gave the, a talk for us, to a, to a packed house. There have to have been three people crammed into the mud box at the library as he gave this talk during All-American Weekend. Um, and it's the, both of these books are examples of where we've been and where we can't go again. Um, with that, let me introduce Billy Joe. Billy Joe is going to introduce our speaker. And those of you from the law school probably know Billy Joe. Those of you from main campus probably don't. Billy Joe is the Associate Dean for um, Library and Information Resources and the Professor of Law at the Washington College of Law. She holds a bachelor's and, um, bachelor's and master's from Indiana University, and she holds a JD from Nova Southeastern University. When she is teaching, as opposed to being a librarian, she teaches courses in cyber, the Cyber Law Seminar, Advanced Legal Research, and Lawyer Reentry Program. She is the president of the Southeast, Southeast Association of Law Schools. For a law librarian to be the president of an association of law schools is quite a tribute to your librarian. Um, she also, over the past year, a, a year ago, was the day-to-day -day point person on the building of the new law school. Um, having just been through remodeling of two floors of the main <laughs> library, I don't know how the woman did it, um, but I'm grateful she did. Billy Joe, would you come and introduce our speaker? Thank you, Nancy, for those very kind remarks. And hair color will cover a lot of gray when you're doing a building project, so uh, we'll start from there. It is a great delight for me to be asked to introduce our guest speaker today. I have a, a little further commute than some of you, and my life would be incomplete without uh, WAMU and all of the various programs. And I actually was driving west on 66 one afternoon and listened to our speaker on fresh air. I literally had to pull over um, because it was just too close to home. Uh, my father was in real estate uh, and a broker in Indiana for over 50 years. And as I was listening, uh, to Mr. Rothstein, I kept thinking, I think my dad was complicit in this, <laughs> and he absolutely would not have wanted to be. So a little bit, and just a little bit, because we really want to hear from Mr. Rothstein and maybe not so much about him. He is a research associate at the Economic Policy Institute and a fellow at the Thurgo Marshall uh, Institute of the NAACP Legal Defense Fund. And he writes in many areas, particularly in where education, race, and ethnicity uh, intersect. We are delighted that you're here this afternoon, and please share all of your wisdom and things that we should know about the color of law. Well, thank you very much for that introduction. And Thanks to all of you for coming here today to engage with me in this conversation. Uh, as you all know, uh, in the 20th century, this country, uh, excuse me, there are a couple of seats up here, and I won't call on you. You know, it's not a <laughs> class, so you can feel free to come up. Uh, there's a couple here in the front row. <laughs> 
Um, all right. <laughs> uh, what I began to say was that uh, in the um, 20th century, this country made a resolution, all of us did, that we were going to abolish racial segregation. Uh, we came to the conclusion, uh, we should have come to it a long time ago, but we came to the conclusion that racial segregation was wrong, that it was harmful, that it was uh, immoral, and that it was unconstitutional. And uh, beginning in 1930s, the, the first place that the civil rights lawyers attacked was law schools. Uh, but you'll forgive me, but uh, they, they, they figured out that if uh, judges were too stupid to understand anything else, they might be able to understand that you couldn't get a good legal education in a segregated law school. So they challenged segregation in law schools. And then using that precedent, they went on to challenge segregation in uh, colleges and universities. And from there, they challenged uh, segregation, as you all know, in, in elementary and secondary schools and Brown versus Board of Education. And then as the civil rights movement grew, uh, we passed legislation uh, in the 1960s that abolished segregation in uh, water fountains and buses and lunch counters and public accommodations, interstate transportation. Uh, we did all these things, and yet we've left untouched the biggest segregation of all which is that every metropolitan area in this country is residentially segregated by race. I've lived in many of them. Uh, in every one I've lived in, there are clearly defined areas where all whites or mostly whites lived, and clearly defined areas where all African Americans or mostly African Americans live. And we all accept this as part of the natural environment. Uh, we don't, uh, it's not that we've tried to undo it and have failed, we haven't even tried to undo it. Uh, it's something that, despite our understanding that racial segregation leaves incomplete the emancipation of slaves by creating a separate class of citizenship, despite our understanding of that, we've left this biggest segregation of, uh, of all untouched. Now, in some senses, it's uh, uh, easy to understand, at least in part, because you know, if we abolish segregation in buses or in water fountains or in lunch counters, uh, the next day you can sit anywhere you want on a bus or drink from any water fountain or go to any restaurant. But if we abolish segregation in neighborhoods, the next day things wouldn't look much different. And so because it's a bit more difficult to undo the racial segregation that we've created in metropolitan areas by residents, we've adopted a myth, a rationalization to justify to ourselves our failure to act, our failure to confront um, uh, this, our failure to uh, complete uh, the emancipation of slaves that the 13th Amendment required us to do. And that rationalization is described by a term that we're all familiar with, that we all use. It's a term that's used by both liberals and conservatives, by both African Americans and whites. It excuses us from doing anything about it, and that is something we call de facto segregation. We tell ourselves that unlike all the other segregations that were uh, undone in the 1960s and 50s and 40s and 30s, unlike all the other forms of racial segregation, this one happened by accident. Neighborhood segregation was not created by government rules, by not created by laws, not created by regulation. It sort of just evolved. It evolved because African Americans and whites happened to like to live with one another of the same race and not, um, not with others. It happened because private homeowners refused to sell homes to uh, families of the other race. It happened because private real estate agents uh, and uh, bankers uh, discriminated. Uh, all of these, and, and it happened because, of course, it happened because African Americans typically have less incomes than whites on average, and so they can't really afford to move to middle class communities. All of these reasons come together to have created residential segregation. It's not something that was deliberate, not something that was enacted by government policy. And we tell ourselves if it happened by accident, it sort of only cannot happen by accident. As I said, it's not something we've tried to undo but have failed at. We've never even tried because we don't consider it in the same category as the other, other forms of segregation that we abolished. Well, I uh, 
spent uh, most of my recent career, at least, uh, uh, until I began to write this book, uh, studying education policy. And I understood that uh, the major problems that we face in education in this country uh, are not the result, as, as our national policy uh, suggested, uh, not the result of low teacher expectations or lack of accountability of schools, but they're the result of the fact that too many children come to school with social and economic disadvantages that translate directly into uh, lower student achievement. And I, was, I used to be the New York Times education columnist, and I wrote a series of columns uh, along these lines describing the actual pathways through which each of these uh, social and economic disadvantages might uh, uh, translate into lower average achievement for children who had these disadvantages. And, and I'm not going to go into a lot of them here because that's not the topic of this talk, but um, for example, one example, uh, we know that low-income African-American children uh, living in urban areas have asthma at four times the rate of white middle-class children. If a child has asthma, the child is likely to be up at night wheezing, come to school drowsy, uh, sleepless, maybe even not come to school at all, be absent more often. And I ex try to explain that if you have two groups of children who are equal in every respect, every respect, except that one group has a higher rate of asthma than the other, that group is going to have lower average achievement, which is not to say that some children with asthma don't have higher achievement than typical children without asthma, because there's a distribution of outcomes for every human characteristic. But on average, it's inevitable that sleepless children are going to achieve at a lower level than children who come to school well-rested. And I went through many of these characteristics, you know, lead poisoning or stress from parental unemployment or uh, lack of uh, 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 early childhood education or a home where parents are poorly educated and haven't read to the child as much. Each of these characteristics predict lower average achievement. And I understood this. And I realized uh, something. I'm, I'm a slow learner, so it took me a while. But um, I soon realized that if you take children with these characteristics, and you concentrate them in single classrooms and schools, it's even more difficult for even the best instruction to overcome them, even in part. And if you have schools where children with these kinds of social and economic disadvantages are concentrated, those schools are inevitably going to perform, or the children in those schools are going to perform at a lower level. On average, there are exceptions, there's a distribution, but on average than children in schools where very few children have these disadvantages. And we call those schools where we concentrate children in um, uh, single schools, single classrooms with, with serious dis social and economic disadvantages. We call those segregated schools. Well, because I was interested in this topic in 2007, I read a Supreme Court decision concerning the school districts of Louisville, Kentucky and Seattle, Washington. Uh, this was a, a decision that uh, ruled on a, a policy that both districts had employed to, to do a very minor desegregation of their schools to try to address the problems I was just describing. Both the Louisville, Kentucky district and the Seattle, Washington district um, had a policy of school choice for their adolescents who could choose which high school they wanted to go to. But if the choice was going to further imbalance the school racially, that choice would not be honored in favor of the choice of a child who had helped to desegregate the school. So if you had a school that was almost all white and both a black and a white child uh, applied for that last remaining place, uh, the black child would be given some preference. A trivial program, trivial program. I, most, most adolescents don't want to go to school away from their friends and outside their neighborhoods. And the cases where you have one place left, and uh, both a black and a white child apply for it, it's trivial. But the Supreme Court said that this program was an offense to the Constitution. It was a violation of civil rights. Uh, you could not take uh, account of a child's race in remedying the segregation of the Louisville and Seattle schools because the Supreme Court said, uh, John Roberts, uh, Chief Justice John Roberts wrote the plurality opinion, because he said the schools in Louisville and Seattle are segregated because the neighborhoods in which they're located are segregated. Well, I thought that was a wise observation on the part of the Chief Justice. But then he went on to say that the neighborhoods in Louisville and Seattle were segregated without government participation. They just happened. There was de facto segregation. 
And the Supreme Court says, he recounted in a series of decisions, that if you have de facto segregation, you're not permitted to consciously remedy it. Well, I remembered, I read that case, and as I say, I've been studying education policy, not um, uh, the topic of this book up until that point. But I remembered a, a case in Louisville, Kentucky, one of the cities where this occurred in the 1950s, where there was a white homeowner in a middle-class suburb of Louisville called Shively. Any of you here from Louisville? OK, all right. So you know this story uh, in, in Shively. And he had a friend who was an African-American Navy veteran. Uh, I believe he was a decorated Navy veteran, a middle class, um, uh, had a middle class job, a good income. Uh, he had a daughter, uh, his wife and, and daughter, and they wanted to move to a, a better neighborhood, a, a single family home in the suburbs. And no realtor or real estate agent would sell them a home. So the white homeowner uh, bought another home for his African-American friend and then resold it to him. Uh, to evade the, the real estate uh, agents. And when the African-American family moved into the home, uh, a mob surrounded the, the, the home, protected by the police. Uh, they threw rocks through the windows. Uh, I've got pictures of this in the book, in my book. Uh, they dynamited and firebombed the home. And at the end of this riot, the state of Kentucky arrested, uh, tried, convicted, and jailed with a 15-year sentence, the white homeowner for sedition. And it occurred to me that this didn't sound much like de facto segregation. I thought maybe, uh, maybe there was more to uh, how Louisville, Kentucky got segregated than John Roberts understood. And I knew a little bit more than that. I'm exaggerating a, a bit, but I had no idea what I was going to find. Uh, but I decided to investigate to see whether segregation didn't wasn't just something that was contributed to by a few government uh, policies and participations like the one in Louisville and some others I knew about, but whether there was a systematic design on the part of government to uh, create racial segregation in every metropolitan area in the country, whether government policies were so interconnected and reinforcing uh, and racially explicit with the design to ensure that African Americans and whites couldn't live near each other, whether that was so powerful that de facto segregation was simply a myth without any basis in reality, and that's what I concluded. I concluded that the residential segregation in every metropolitan area in this country is as unconstitutional as segregation of water fountains or segregation of buses or segregation of lunch counters and public accommodations. And uh, being unconstitutional, we're obligated as American citizens to remedy it. And we are failing in our obligations if we fail to understand the history of how government created, not just participated in, but created the residential segregation that we all know, uh, and, and, and don't take steps uh, to, to remedy it, to reverse it. So let me describe in, in the few minutes I have this morning to some of the major policies that the government uh, uh, followed in order to create explicitly with, with purposeful racial design the segregation of um, American cities and metropolitan areas. Uh, one I'll talk about is public housing. Now, I know that all of you have an image of public housing. I did. It's a place where poor people live. It's a place where um, lots of uh, mothers, uh, single mothers with children, lots of young men who don't have jobs in the formal economy, who are um, unemployed or working in the informal economy, in the illegal economy, getting in co into confrontations with the police, uh, frequently leading to violence. Um, this is our image, all of us, of public housing. That's not how public housing began in this country. It began, the first civilian public housing in this country was built in the New Deal by the Roosevelt administration. It was designed for working class families who could afford the full cost of the housing they rent. The public housing that the New Deal built was not subsidized. Uh, the, the families had jobs. They were among those who had jobs. The unemployed were not eligible for public housing. Uh, they, they were people who had jobs who could pay the full cost of their housing and rent, but because there was little ec economic activity in the Depression, there was no housing available. And the Public Works Administration, the first uh, New Deal agency, built public housing, mostly for white working class families, some for African Americans, but always segregated. 
They built segregated projects everywhere in the country, frequently segregating communities that hadn't known segregation before. And that may surprise you. Um, there were many integrated neighborhoods in urban areas in the early and mid 20th century, many more than, than there are today. Uh, we would be stunned if we were transported back to the mid to early 20th century to see the extent of integration that existed in, in downtown areas for the simple reason that workers didn't have automobiles to get to work. Uh, they had to be able to walk to work, and most jobs were concentrated in the central city. So if you had factories uh, or a factory district where African Americans and Irish immigrants and Italian immigrants and Jewish immigrants and migrants from rural areas were all working, they all had to live in broadly the same neighborhoods. I was struck the other day uh, when I was reading the obituary of Linda Brown, who was the uh, the daughter of the chief plaintiff in um, the Brown versus Board of Education decision. Maybe some of you noticed this paragraph. She lived in an integrated neighborhood. It was her school that was segregated, but the neighborhood was integrated. She had lots of white playmates. Um, uh, this was not unusual, as I say, in the early uh, and even mid-20th century when Linda Brown was growing up. Um, the great African-American poet Langston Hughes describes how he grew up in his autobiography, uh, uh, he describes how he grew up in an integrated Cleveland neighborhood. He, uh, the autobiography is The Big C. I'm sure the library has a copy of it. You can get it if you haven't read it. Uh, he, he describes how he, he, his best friend was Polish in high school, he said. He dated a Jewish girl. Uh, this was not unique in early and mid-20th century America. And he lived in a, a neighborhood of downtown Cleveland called the Central Neighborhood of Cleveland. The Public Works Administration demolished integrated housing in that neighborhood to build two separate projects, one for whites, one for African Americans, creating a segregated pattern in a community that had previously been integrated. And this happened in many, many places. Uh, I, I like to write in the book about places like Cambridge, Massachusetts or Berkeley, California, because people think of these as being liberal places. And uh, I, I figure if I can explain to you that it happened in those places, you'll understand that it happened everywhere. Cambridge, Massachusetts, I don't know if any of you ever went to school and in Cambridge, uh, uh, lots of universities around there. The, the Central Square neighborhood near MIT was a, uh, an integrated neighborhood in the 1930s. It was about 40, 60, pretty evenly split between African Americans and whites. The Public Works Administration demolished housing in that neighborhood and built two separate projects, one for African Americans and one for whites, creating a pattern of segregation that previously hadn't existed and probably never would have existed if the Public Works Administration hadn't um, required it. Uh, elsewhere in Boston, uh, uh, the same thing happened. Uh, there was a, a, a project called Mission Hill. Um, a Mission Hill project was for uh, whites. The Mission Hill East project across the street was for African Americans. And a newspaper reporter once went to, I, I described this in the book, and went to the, the rental office where people lined up to pay their rent. And there were two separate lines for the two projects. One was all white, paying rent for the Mission Hill project, one was all black, paying rent for the Mission Hill East project, and the reporter observed that you could have been in Alabama. Uh, I think what he should have done is gone to Alabama and said you could have been in Boston, Massachusetts, because this was the pattern everywhere, even in the South. The South had integrated neighborhoods. Um, just as I mentioned a few minutes ago in the Topeka, uh, Linda Brown lived in an integrated neighborhood, even though she had to go to a segregated school in Atlanta. There was an integrated neighborhood um, in downtown Atlanta called the Flats. The Public Works Administration demolished integrated housing in that neighborhood, and built a project for whites only, uh, forcing the African Americans who were displaced to live in more overcrowded uh, conditions, doubling up with relatives, um, uh, not, of course, given any compensation for the, the, the demolition of their homes. In World War II, this, the, the policy became even more intense uh, as, as those of you who know your, your um, economic history know that uh, uh, during the war, uh, hundreds of thousands of workers flocked to centers of defense production uh, to take the first jobs that were available to them uh, since the beginning of the Depression. Uh, they flocked in such great numbers, hundreds of thousands, that frequently they overwhelmed the communities where they came because the plants were there, and uh, there was no housing for them. Uh, if the government wanted the ships and the tanks and the airplanes and the jeeps uh, to continue to being produced, it had to somehow figure out a way of housing the workers who were coming to these uh, plants that previously had not even existed 
And so I describe in the book a community, a suburb of Berkeley called Richmond, California. It's the center of shipbuilding on the West Coast. Uh, there was no shipbuilding there before World War II. The Kaiser shipyards uh, uh, established shipyards on, on, the, on the bay in Richmond, uh, just north of Berkeley. And um, by the end of the war, there were 100,000 workers in these shipyards. Uh, if you consider their, their families, uh, there were probably an influx of 400,000 people just for the shipyards alone. Richmond had a population of 20,000, all white. There were very few African Americans on the West Coast uh, uh, prior to World War II. Uh, the, the first great migration during World War I affected mostly the East and the Midwest. It was the second great migration during World War II as a result of this war work that uh, brought African Americans to the West Coast. So Rich, Rich, Richmond didn't have a, a significant African American population. There were a few um, uh, African Americans living on the outskirts who were working as domestics in, in white families' homes, and they were generally families of Pullman car porters who were, uh, ha were living on, out there because uh, the Intercontinental Railroad would only hire African Americans as Pullman car porters. But it was a white community of 20,000. The federal government built housing for these 100,000 workers and their families. It built temporary housing, um, shoddy housing uh, uh, for African Americans along the railroad tracks in the industrial area. Uh, uh, it was temporary because the city of Richmond announced that any African Americans who came to the city to take jobs during the war would have to leave at the end of the war. And it built uh, more stable housing for the white workers, the white migrant workers, in the uh, residential areas of, of Richmond itself, the uh, white areas. Again, creating a pattern of segregation in a community that never had segregation before because it didn't have any African Americans to segregate. And had the government built integrated housing, a very different pattern would have evolved in, in that community. And we have um, you know, what social scientists call an existence proof of that because there was one project in the entire nation which was integrated, and that was also in the San Francisco Bay Area. There was another shipyard north of San Francisco in Marin City, which if you know, the, the, it's across the Golden Gate Bridge. And uh, this was another shipyard that grew so rapidly that uh, the government simply put up barracks for single men. And as they arrived, the, the, the government agents simply handed out pillows and blankets and told them to go find a place to sleep. And it was done on an obviously integrated basis. They didn't have time to create two separate sets of barracks. And there were no problems, so when the families arrived they, the, in Marin City, uh, they integrated that project as well. And it stands in contrast to every other project in the country that was built for war workers always on a segregated basis. So far as I know, this was the only example of a war project built by the government which was not segregated. After World War II, uh, the situation for housing was equally dire. And remember, we're talking about working families who had jobs, uh, either in the Depression or in World War II in the war industries. We're not yet talking about subsidized housing. This is housing for working families. And after World War II, millions of returning war veterans were coming back to the country, needing housing, uh, doubling up with relatives, uh, living in Quonset huts and open fields. Uh, there's an enormous housing shortage. No housing had been built in the Depression, as, as I said before. And um, uh, uh, during World War II, it was prohibited to use construction materials for civilian purposes, uh, except for the housing for war workers, war workers. So there was uh, no housing built then either. So there was an enormous backlog for these returning war veterans. So President Truman proposed a vast expansion of the uh, national public housing program. Again, I emphasize, for working families, uh, this was not a, a program that was going to cost very much money because people were going to pay rent to cover the cost of the housing. But he proposed a vast expansion to take care of these returning war veterans. And conservatives in Congress wanted to defeat Truman's National Housing Act. They wanted to defeat it not because, for racial reasons, it was segregated. They were comfortable with that. They wanted to defeat it not because they didn't like poor people. This wasn't housing for poor people. This was housing for working class families. They wanted to defeat it simply because they thought that public housing was socialistic. And the government shouldn't be involved in public housing. It should be done by the private sector. And not that the private sector was doing anything to provide housing for war workers. So they came up with a poison pill strategy to defeat the 1949 Housing Act. A poison pill strategy is a strategy that opponents of a bill uh, 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 attach an amendment uh, to a bill which they think is non-controversial and can get passed, uh, 
But once it's attached to the bill and combined to the rest of the bill, it makes the entire bill unpalatable and the bill goes down to defeat. So conservatives in Congress in 1949 proposed an amendment to the National Housing Act that from now on, public housing had to be integrated. No more segregation in public housing. No more discrimination uh, by the federal government in public housing. It was a cynical move. Uh, they didn't much care about integration. But they figured they would vote for this amendment. Northern liberals would join them in voting for the amendment. The amendment would then pass. And when the full bill came up before Congress, conservative, um, the conservatives would then vote against. They would flip and vote against the entire bill. Uh, they would be joined by uh, Southern Democrats who were in favor only of segregated housing, not of integrated housing. That would create a new majority to defeat the bill. So liberals in Congress campaigned against the integration amendment. They were led by the leading civil rights advocate in the United States Senate, Hubert Humphrey who had made a name for himself just the previous year by demanding a civil rights platform in the Democratic Party platform in the 1948 election. Liberals in Congress campaigned against the integration amendment. This was 1949. You know, I know you're a lot, of, a lot of young people here, but to me that's not so long ago. You know, it's only yesterday. Um, liberals campaigned against the integration amendment. They defeated the integration amendment. The full bill then came up before Congress. And it came up as a continued segregated program. Southern Democrats voted for the public housing bill. Northern Democrats voted for the public housing bill. And we got the vast expansion of public housing that we're familiar with today. Um, giant towers in places like Chicago, the Robert Taylor Homes, Cabrini Green, uh, uh, in St. Louis, the pruitt Igo Towers, all on a segregated basis. Uh, pruitt Igo in St. Louis was actually two projects. Pruitt was for African Americans. I go was for whites. And let me emphasize, and I, I know this is obvious to you, but I just want to make clear, you know, it's not because whites happen to like to apply to I go because they want to live with others of the same race. And African Americans happen to want to apply to Pruitt because they like each other. This was an explicitly labeled project uh, by race. And, and the subtitle of my book, the, the title is The Color of Law, the subtitle is A Forgotten History of How Our Government Segregated America. Nothing hidden about this. Everybody knew what was going on. Everybody knew that this was government policy. It was voted on in Congress. Uh, the federal government used that segregation vote in Congress as its basis, as its justification for continuing to segregate all federal housing programs, not just public housing, for the next 15 years. Well, soon after these projects were built, a development occurred uh, across the country which was quite surprising and systematic everywhere. Everywhere in the country, there developed suddenly large numbers of vacancies in the white projects and long waiting lists in the black projects. Uh, as soon as this became such a conspicuous and untenable situation to have two projects in the same city, one with long waiting lists and the other with large numbers of vacancies, that the government and local housing agencies eventually opened up all the projects to African Americans. At about the same time, industry left the cities because um, they no we were building highways, and we no longer needed deep water ports or railroad terminals to bring raw materials to, to factories or to ship with finished products. Highways could do it. Trucks could do it. So industry left the cities and moved out to rural areas, the suburbs, where they could get more land. There were fewer and fewer jobs in the urban areas near the public housing projects, which were now increasingly African American. The residents of those projects became poorer and poorer. Eventually, they could no longer pay the full cost of the projects in rent, and the government had to begin subsidizing it. It became a program for poor people, and um, public housing, uh, the, the government no longer, public housing agencies no longer uh, uh, maintained them well. They no longer invested in them because they were subsidized, and they turned into the, the concentrated slums that uh, we have as an image of public housing today. That's not how it began, and it's important to remember that history. But I want to talk to you now, or just why was it? I asked myself the question, because I studied public housing first when I was doing this research, why was it all these vacancies in the white projects and long waiting lists in the black projects? And that was because of another federal program that was even more powerful in creating racial segregation than the public housing program itself. And that was a program by another New Deal agency, the Federal Housing Administration, 
established in 1934, the year after the Public Works Administration that built the first public housing. A program of the Federal Housing Administration to suburbanize the entire white population into single-family homes outside urban areas. This was an explicitly racial program. It's not a program to suburbanize working class people that whites happen to take advantage of. It was a program to suburbanize the white population into single family homes. Uh, the, um, after I did the research for the book, because I would have put this in it if I knew, I, I found in, in the archives a, a poster that the Federal Housing Administration had created during World War II. Uh, it showed an African American man being led away in handcuffs and the, the headline in the poster was, Escape Crime, Move to the Suburbs. This was a federal government propaganda. Uh, it actually began before the, the propaganda began after, before the uh, Federal Housing Administration. In the 1920s, uh, the Department of Commerce sent community organizers to white neighborhoods everywhere in the country to tell people to move to the suburbs to avoid racial strife. That was their, that was their quote from the... the the, the instructions to these community organizers. But before the Federal Housing Administration came into being, this propaganda didn't have much effect because working class people couldn't afford to move to the suburbs. So you could propagandize them, but they were still living in apartments and rented apartments in cities. What the Federal Housing Administration did beginning in the late 1930s and then increasing in the 1940s was recruit a cadre of mass production builders to create giant suburbs in every community in the country, in every metropolitan area in the country for whites only, uh, creating what the analysts later termed a federally created white noose around every metropolitan area. Uh, the best known of these suburbs is Levittown, east of New York City. I'm sure you've, you've, uh, many of you uh, uh, have heard of that. Uh, yeah? No? Yeah? Yeah? Yeah. Okay. Uh, some of you may um, recall uh, hearing a song that Malvina Renz wrote, Pete Seeger sang it, about little boxes on a hillside uh, made of ticky-tacky, and they all looked the same. That was a giant subdivision uh, south of San Francisco. Uh, Los Angeles became the, the symbol of suburbanization uh, in the 1950s. Uh, places like Lakewood uh, near uh, a McDonnell Douglas plant or um, uh, Panorama City in the San Fernando Valley or uh, Westchester, just west of Los Angeles. Any of you from Los Angeles? Okay. Uh, these were all federally ha fe Federal Housing Administration created suburbs for whites only. The way, only way they could happen is, uh, you know, someone like Levitt or um, uh, uh, Henry Dolger who built the, the, the little boxes on the hillside or um, any of these developers everywhere in the country, they couldn't. How, how does Levitt assemble the capital? to build 17,000 homes, that's how big Levittown was, to build 17,000 homes for which he had yet no buyers. No private builder could engage in a project like that on his own. The only way Levitt could do it was by going to the Federal Housing Administration, submitting his plans for the development, which included everything from the materials he was going to use to the design of the homes to the setback from the streets, every detail, and a FHA required commitment that he sell no homes to African Americans. Now, this was not an informal uh, requirement of bureaucrats acting on their own. The Federal Housing Administration had a written manual, which went out to appraisers everywhere in the country. And I, uh, in, in, in my book, I have uh, quotes from this manual. It, it, had, it said things like uh, appraisers could not approve a development that was proposed by a developer except for the same racial class. Uh, not that they were uh, building developments for both racial classes, but it had to be for the same racial class. Uh, the, another f a section of the manual said that it couldn't be built, a suburb couldn't be built um, in, a, in an area near an African-American neighborhood because it would run the risk of, quote, infiltration by incompatible racial elements. This was language in the federal manual. This is not de facto segregation. This is an explicit written policy by the federal government that segregated this country. And, um, you know, Levitt, 17,000 homes. The Federal Housing Administration also required Levitt and these other subdivision developments to include a clause in the deed of every home prohibiting resale to African Americans or rental to African Americans. And those deeds still exist today. If you go to any of these suburbs, or really any, any homes in this country uh, built in the mid-20th and early 20th century, you'll find that language in the deeds. You can't take language out of a deed 
uh, without uh, extensive legal work, expensive extensive legal work. That was a federal requirement. The incentive was so great that white families could move out of single, out of um, public housing, and move to single-family homes in these working-class suburbs, these inexpensive working-class suburbs, and pay less in their monthly housing charges with an FHA or VA mortgage for their single-family homes than they were paying for rent in public housing. That's how enormous this subsidy was. These were working-class families. Um, uh, my uncle, uh, 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 a returning war veteran, bought a home in, in Levittown, raised his family. My cousin's there. Um, he stocked vegetables in the supermarket. These were not affluent people. These were people, African Americans, could easily have afforded those same homes. Uh, they were prohibited from buying them. The home sold for about eight or nine thousand dollars a piece. They were seven hundred fifty square feet, very modest homes. Uh, in today's money, inflation adjusted, that's you know a little bit less than a hundred thousand dollars. Any working class family can afford to buy a home for a hundred thousand dollars with an FHA or VA mortgage, which required no down payment. Uh, the, this was not a question of income differences. This was a racial exclusive policy designed to segregate metropolitan areas. And today, those homes that sold for about $100,000 in uh, uh, the mid-20th century now sell for $200,000, $300,000, $500,000, depending on the part of the country. The white families, the white working class families who bought those homes gained over the next couple of generations I mean, you can do the arithmetic, you can subtract 100000 uh, They gained uh, $300,000, $500,000 in equity and wealth. Middle class families in this country gain what wealth they have from the equity they have in their homes. They don't gain it from speculating in the stock market like rich people do. Um, yeah? Could, could we give some time to the students? Because yeah. I think that you have, you have given such a persuasive case that was so pervasive. But I'm sure a lot of the students here would like to probe you. Sure, sure. I can stop here. Yeah. Questions? Yeah. No, 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 no. no, no. no. You haven't heard the end of this yet. <laughs> Go ahead. Would you stand, please, just so that we can all hear you better? Thank you. I guess you mean. I guess the main thing I'm curious about is. How was there no uh, African American equivalent to that program to, you know, allow people to move out to the suburbs? How does that, uh, e even you know, uh, uh, meet like a separate but equal standard? You know. Well, uh, as you know, separate but equal is never equal. Never has been. It wasn't equal. Separate but equal wasn't in equal in schools, and it wasn't equal in any other institution. So. The Federal Housing Administration built a very tiny number of uh, subdivisions for African Americans, but very tiny. It was overwhelmingly a program uh, for whites, and it was always segregated. Thank you so much for speaking with us today. Um, I haven't had a chance to read the book yet, but I'm wondering specifically, since you've outlined all these discriminatory policies, what do we do now? Because um, I know that not only these policies are affecting people today, but also that people are discriminating against um, people of color in um, giving bank loans for housing as well. That, that's very rampant today as well. So I was wondering what recommendations you have for us now. The biggest um, bar to desegregating this country is not the ongoing discrimination which you've just described, which still exists. It's the legacies of these earliest, earlier policies. Um, you know, I, I was describing a, a minute ago the, the wealth that, that white families gain from living in these suburbs. Today, African American incomes, on average, are 60 percent of white incomes. African American wealth is 10 percent of white wealth. And that enormous disparity between a 60 percent income ratio and a 10 percent wealth ratio is entirely attributable to unconstitutional federal housing policy. And even if we fully enforced the non-discriminatory provisions of the Fair Housing Act, which we don't enforce, as you just mentioned, that wealth gap would still 
be the dominant factor that is perpetuating segregation. Now, there are many, many policies that we could follow if we understood this history. And, and we need, I think, a new civil rights movement that's going to focus on housing segregation. Uh, a new civil rights movement has to include not just understanding this history, that's part of it, but it also has to understand, the, uh, uh, include the kind of uh, activism and, and activity and mass demonstrations and pressure and organization that past civil rights movements have. So, but there are many, many policies that we could follow that are quite easy. Some of them would be expensive, some of them would be cost-free. And I can give you a couple examples of what we would do now. Except I want the caveat is this is no political support for them now. So the first step is not to sit here and fantasize or stand here and fantasize about policies we could follow, but to develop a, a consciousness and awareness and a new civil rights movement that's going to press for them. So, for example, we could enforce uh, the Fair Housing Act much, much better than we do, which prohibits ongoing discrimination in housing and in lending uh, and in racial steering, but does nothing to remedy past discrimination. We have several programs that the, the federal government runs three programs, three major programs in the housing field now. One, the biggest one, is a subsidy for single family homeowners in mostly all white communities, and that's the mortgage interest deduction. And if we were serious about, uh, and that, if we were serious about uh, dismantling this racial segregation, we could, for example, withhold the mortgage interest deduction from communities that refuse to desegregate. For example, by uh, enacting zoning ordinances that lock in uh, wealthy, exclusively wealthy homes and don't permit the construction in, within their jurisdiction of uh, single family homes on small lot sizes or townhouses or other uh, uh, kinds of construction that would diversify the community. We don't even have to withhold it permanently. We could put these mortgage interest deductions in escrow until the community started to desegregate. But you know, there's no political support for a policy like that. Uh, the other two federal programs are, are subsidies for, for low-income housing, which are primarily are for um, minority families. One is a, a program that you're probably familiar with. It's, it's well known. It's called the Section 8 Voucher Program. Section 8 voucher program perpetuates and reinforces segregation. A low-income family who gets a federal subsidy for their rent, that's what the low-income housing, that's, that's what the Section 8 program uh, does, is more likely to live in segregated neighborhoods than a low-income family with the same low-income minority family who lives in a less segregated neighborhood. And that's because the Section 8 program reinforces segregation. Uh, the, the, um, the voucher amounts are too small, typically, to rent in middle-class communities. In most places in the country, landlords are permitted, despite the Fair Housing Act, to discriminate against people who get a federal subsidy for their rent. They don't have to say, I'm not renting to you because you're black. They can say, I'm not renting to you because I don't like where your rent comes from. And um, the way the Section 8 housing program is administered uh, reinforces segregation because it's, it's based on a local housing authority jurisdiction which typically doesn't include the entire metropolitan area, it just includes the city. So for example, after Ferguson, after the riots in Ferguson, the St. Louis City Council uh, passed a law saying that landlords could no longer discriminate against Section 8 voucher holders. But it wasn't, uh, uh, it wasn't a meaningful uh, law because the problem was the discrimination of people in St. Louis County, not discrimination of, of landlords within the city. And so we need to restructure it that way. The other big program that we have is the Low Income Housing Tax Credit, which is a subsidy for builders of low income housing. And it's run by the Treasury Department. And that also reinforces segregation because developers who get those tax credits would much rather build in a segregated neighborhood than a, in a middle class neighborhood. Uh, the land is cheaper in low income segregated neighborhoods. And they don't have to hold 55 community meetings to justify why they're going ahead with their project. We could easily change that program, and it would cost nothing. Neither of these uh, changes that I've talked about so far would cost anything. We could easily change uh, that uh, program so that tax credits were only given or given pr as a priority to developers who would develop housing for low and moderate income families in high opportunity communities. And then if we really got serious, of course, we should be subsidizing the purchase of homes in middle class communities for African Americans who were denied the acquisition of wealth in the, in the 20th century, and that would cost money. But there are many, many policies we could follow uh, to uh, 
to reverse the segregation, we first have to understand that it was created by government, and if it was created by government, government can undo it if there's the political will to do so. Thank you. Hi, everybody. My name is Shadé Tuckett. I'm a student at SIS, second year um, IPCR program. I just want to say thank you for speaking today. This was very informative, especially at a school, at the School of International Service. Uh, my main question is, I understand that all of these policies were explicitly anti-black, as most racial history is centered on anti-blackness. How exactly did this affect non-black people of color like um, Asians or Latinos? Was it, was it explicitly against, was it explicitly non-white people or you know, where do people sort of fall within the margins? Well, you have to remember that these policies that I'm describing were practiced in the mid 20th century at a time when the federal government didn't think the country extended west of the Mississippi. Uh, it, uh, you know, there was no baseball team west of St. Louis at the time these policies were enacted. Um, so they were directed at African Americans. Um, on the West Coast, there was certainly, and I would certainly not uh, ever suggest that there wasn't state-sponsored discrimination against Hispanics and Asians as well. But it was not nearly of the same degree. It was not nearly as intense and it was not nearly as persistent. And I'll give you one example just to illustrate that. They were segre they were segregated projects in Texas, for example, that were, um, well, let's say Austin, Texas. The first public housing was built um, uh, under the National Housing, the first National Housing Act, not the Public Works Administration I was talking about, but after 1937, was built in Austin, Texas, because the public housing program was promoted by the local Austin congressman, whose name most of you probably know. Lyndon Johnson. He was the biggest proponent of public housing. And there were three projects built there, one for whites, one for African Americans, one for Latinos. But the project for blacks was located in an area that Austin had designated as a black community. And so Austin began to close school. We had segregated schools at the time. They closed schools elsewhere in the city to force people to move into this African American neighborhood. There was a Latino project, but there were no schools for Latinos that were closed elsewhere to force people to move into a single concentrated area. In California, many of the deeds that were attached to these houses that were racially exclusive that I talked about, not only excluded African Americans, but also excluded Mexicans. But when they came before courts, when, family, when whites sued to have an African American evicted who had moved into a home in violation of one of these covenants, courts in California refused to enforce it because they said that Hispanics were really Caucasians and the, 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 the laws couldn't be enforced against them. So there was certainly discrimination against them, but the, the degree and intensity was not nearly what it was for African Americans. This is a legacy of slavery, and I think that we have other immigrant groups who have suffered, who have suffered discrimination, but uh, it's an entirely different um, uh, problem in history. Hello. Yeah, thank you so much. Um, a big part of that narrative is how we followed where housing has been available um, when the jobs changed. So people came into the cities and where people were allowed to live or incentivized to live changed. Um, after World War II, you saw the suburbanization of white workers. Um, since 2000, a city like D.C. has seen a huge influx of people into the city as new jobs and new industries pick up in the cities. Um, and now we have issues where uh, poor minority people being pushed further and further away from urban centers where there's public transit and more jobs and wealth. How do we balance protecting people who've been living in cities for a long time who are now getting more and more benefit to living in the city with the power of equity and building out owning spaces in the suburbs? We're referring to something that we call gentrification. Uh, gentrification is not a new thing. We just had a different name for it in the 20th century. We called it urban renewal. And um, the, the idea of uh, destroying housing for low-income minority families in urban areas um, and uh, not making adequate provision for their relocation is something that we've done for the last 60 years. Reformers and people who are opposed to gentrification typically focus 
on trying to preserve a share of housing in the gentrifying neighborhood for low-income families who used to live there. And that's a worthy goal. I don't object. I certainly object. I support it. It's uh, something that should be done. But what they overlook is that even if we were successful in preserving a share of housing and for low-income, and we, there are many policies we could follow from inclusionary zoning to freezing property taxes, uh, lots of policies we can follow to do that, it's still going to be the case that most families living in those neighborhoods are going to be displaced. And where are they going to be displaced to? If they're simply going to be displaced to a new segregated uh, minority neighborhood, then we're doing exactly the same thing we did in the 1950s and 60s and 70s and 80s with urban renewal. So, for example, after, after the Ferguson riots, you know, people asked me, you know, how did Ferguson, it's a suburb, how come it's African American? We thought African Americans lived in cities. And Ferguson became a majority African American community because of urban renewal in, in central St. Louis. Uh, they demolished the, a number of African American neighborhoods, and one of them they built, you know, half of the McDonald's sign to indicate it was um, the gateway to the West. Um, uh, they built universities and, and hospitals in that area. And the uh, suburbs were mostly closed to African Americans except for one area, Ferguson and another town next to it, Jennings. Uh, and that's where landlords were willing to rent to African Americans, so they all moved to that place. It didn't, you know, we simply shifted the black community around. If we were able to open up the suburbs, for example, by prohibiting exclusionary zoning ordinances that uh, prohibit the construction of single family homes and small lot sizes and townhouses, then gentrification could, if stabilized, result in integration of both the urban areas and the suburban areas. But if we simply wind up, as we are doing in most cities today, shifting the displaced African American population, or in many cities now Latino population, into newly segregated areas, uh, then we're uh, doing much more harm than good. Thank you. Thank you for your presentation and the narrative. Uh, the question that comes to mind for me is this. In terms of uh, your research, whether for this book or in your career, uh, have you encountered and examined the question of the status of people of color, African Americans, vis-a-vis -vis or in comparison to uh, their white counterparts as, is, uh, as it is stated in the Constitution, whether that be the 13th or 14th or 15th Amendment? And if you could speak to that. Well, I don't know what more I can say about it. The 13th Amendment um, abolished slavery, but when Congress adopted the 13th Amendment and the, the, the states uh, that uh, were the northern states uh, ratified it, it was not their intention to create second-class citizenship. It was not their intention to simply convert slaves into serfs or sharecroppers. And indeed, Congress in 1866 passed a law that the 13th Amendment um, authorized Congress to do to enforce the 13th Amendment that prohibited uh, discrimination in housing because it's Congress rationalized instead that private discrimination in housing was perpetuating a subordinate status which was inconsistent with emancipation. The Supreme Court refused to permit that law to be enforced. It said it, it narrowed the meaning of the 13th Amendment in an 1883 decision. And the Supreme Court, in its infinite wisdom, didn't admit until 1968 that it was wrong in making that decision 102 years earlier, which um, uh, uh, permitted a private discrimination in housing. So the 13th and then the 14th Amendment uh, explicitly prohibits uh, denying due process uh, which uh, and equal protection. Uh, so that is uh, the policies I'm describing when done by state governments uh, violated the 14th Amendment and uh, the Fifth Amendment prohibits similar activity on the part of the federal government. So these were unconstitutional uh, policies that we followed and the Constitution requires, uh, constitutional civil rights violations re require a remedy. So um, I don't know if that answers your question. I, I guess I'm just repeating what I said before, but. We have time for a couple more questions before we, we hold this up. Um, one here in the front and, and one here. Yeah. Thank you. I'm an AU Osher student.
Um, I'm wondering about the presidents during um, the, uh, the highlight of this period. To what extent um, were presidents involved in housing decisions or were even aware of them? Or should we be calling FDR, Truman, Eisenhower segregation, segregationists? Well, um, FDR, uh, Franklin Roosevelt's position was that um, he would do nothing that would uh, interfere with fighting the Depression or winning World War II. He said on many occasions those were only two priorities. He would do nothing that was controversial outside those two priorities. And so he rebuffed the efforts to get him to intervene in these policies that federal agencies were following because he knew that it would be controversial to do so and uh, it would uh, interfere in his view of the war effort. Franklin Roosevelt even refused to um, support an anti-lynching bill because he thought it would interfere with uh, anti-depression measures and um, uh, fighting the war. Uh, there were people in his administration who uh, disagreed with uh, his policy. Uh, the Secretary of Labor, Francis Perkins, the Secretary of um, uh, Interior, Harold Dickies, um, uh, opposed the, the racial policies that the administration was following. But um, Roosevelt's position always was that uh, that was not his priority. His wife, as you know, he was paralyzed. He sent his wife around the country to meet with people because he couldn't get around the country to find out what the effect of his policies were. And the more African Americans she met, the more uh, adamant she became about uh, changing the racial policies of the administration. But um, she didn't win her arguments with her husband on that ground. And our last question is here. Uh, Dr. Rothstein, could you comment on uh, uh, how Ben Carson is doing, uh, other, than the f other than the fact that he made that mistake with the uh, $31,000 for the dining room set, has he had any uh, positive uh, results and what he's done in 15 months being in the current administration? No, of course not. Um, you know, uh, Carson said um, uh, at one point uh, before he was confirmed, he said that uh, he was opposed to policies of integration because that was a form of social engineering. And he's opposed to social engineering. What he didn't understand is that integration policies is an attempt to undo social engineering, not to uh, uh, create social engineering. But I, I, I want to say this. I, uh, even if we had the most progressive integration-oriented Secretary of Housing and Urban Development and the most progressive integration-oriented administration, we would not be in any better position than we are now because the American people don't understand this history and we don't have a civil rights movement that's mobilized around changing it. And policy does not begin in Washington. Policy begins in the people who elect the people in Washington. So let me, I want to conclude by saying this. Um, in the course of, because I'm so interested in education, in the course of uh, uh, writing this book, I looked at the textbooks which teach American history in every high school and middle school in the country. And every one of them lies about this. The most commonly used American history textbook um, is called The Americans. It's 1,200 pages. It uh, has one paragraph that subheaded uh, discrimination in the North, one sentence on housing, and the sentence reads as follows. In the North, African Americans found themselves forced in segregated housing. That's it. Passive voice sentence. Uh, you know, the copy editors missed that one. Um, the, if the next generation, if the next generation isn't taught this history any better than we've been taught it, they are going to be in as poor a position to remedy it as we've been, no matter who the Secretary of Housing and Urban Development is. And every one of you, every one of us, has children or nieces or nephews or grandchildren or sisters or brothers uh, in schools, and we have contact with principals and superintendents and uh, uh, PTAs and school board members. And we can do something about this as a first step to building that kind of civil rights movement. We can try to see that the schools in which our children are taught are not being mistaught this myth of de facto segregation. You know, the textbook I just mentioned had pages about uh, the wonderful things that the Federal Housing Administration did 
to help the working class become middle class families. It's true, but it was not the entire working class. So that's something that every one of us can do to, um, to help to change this. Much more important than, than sitting around and fantasizing about policies that today are politically unrealistic. We can make them politically realistic. So thank you very much. Okay.